I just gotta, you know, get your your breakdown on on Mel. Mel fighting uh, Canelo. Uh, how, how do you see it? Is the weight jump for those two divisions will it be too much or will it affect Mel? You feel in your opinion? Um, you know, it's strange for Mel because this is Mel first time going that high, and he's doing it for two weight classes. So to jump one weight class is good, but when you jump two, it's a little bit different because it's a more of a significant amount of weight. And with that significant amount of weight, you don't know how your body going to react to that. That's why I go ahead, guys, you to go up a couple pounds, now up a couple more pounds, now to see how their bodies react. You're just going to take that, what, 18-pound jump? 14-pound jump. Yeah. You're going to take that 14-pound jump. Six, yeah, yeah. You're going to take that 14-pound jump, and you're going to see what happens. You know what I mean? But that's dangerous because you don't know how your body's going to react. With 14 pounds more, can you carry that for 12 rounds? Mm -hmm. Can you take the punch that way at 12 rounds? It's, it's a lot of questions to be answered. And you didn't start with the six pound jump, you went all the way to the 14 pound jump. You understand me? Now, if you're a special guy, which he may be, then he can do that, no problem. Mm -hmm. Cause if you think about it, Canelo started the same way. Just Canelo went a little bit at a time. He went from the six pound jump, then he went on to the eight pound jump, then he went on even higher. When he got to the 75 pound, it didn't work out too well for him. Yeah. So. At what point does the weight start to affect you? You understand me? And if you don't know, it's, you definitely don't know if you just jump up there and see. So that's a, it's, a, it's kind of a suspicious but a gutty thing he's doing. Some people have mentioned that this is the perfect time for him because they feel that Canelo might be slipping a little bit given his uh, fight with, um, no, 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 the uh, John Ryder in Mexico where he didn't look that great. Well, he didn't look that great against John Ryder, but you got to understand, he knew what John Ryder was just like we knew what John Ryder was. He knew what Charlo is just like we know what Charlo is. When you playing the Golden State Warriors is one thing. When you playing a lesser team, Orlando Magic right now, who really ain't came around yet, it's a different game. So you don't go to the Orlando Magic with the same attitude you go to the Golden State Warriors. With, right? Not right now, because Orlando Magic hasn't proved himself to be that formidable yet. So if they prove themselves to be that formidable, then you will. But Golden State, you know right now, is a championship caliber team. You go see Golden State, you got to be ready. So when he went to see Ryder, he like, oh, this is just Orlando Magic. But when he go see Charlo, this ain't no Orlando Magic. He got the same belts that I left in the beginning. You understand me? So I better be ready. Overall, now that it's been a week, we've had a chance to see replays, yep. kind of, you know, think about what happened. What's the, the biggest takeaways for you as both fighter and trainer that you had from that fight? Uh, three takeaways. A, Bud Crawford's been looking for a name to solidify itself at the top of the pound for pound list for at least five years now. Uh, Errol Spence was that name. Unfortunately for Errol Spence, he had a car wreck that he got thrown from the vehicle doing an uh, access of 100 miles per hour. And to come back from that is almost like coming back from the dead. So he unfortunately didn't get the opportunity to fight at what I would call 100% from his side. C, with the way that they fought the fight and with the way their careers have been built, I don't think that Errol's career, on a technical standpoint from a coaching point of view, had advanced the way that Bud's career had advanced. And I say that because a lot of people were, were often trying to um, compare opposition to me. You can't compare opposition when one guy has winning every fight he's had as the A side or the guy that we expected to win, including when he fought Kell Brook over in the UK. The other guy, I did his basically whole career on HBO. His initial fight was against British Prescott, who had just knocked out Amir Khan, who he really wasn't expected to beat. So I saw this guy come in. I make adjustment after adjustment after adjustment to beat everything that HBO put in front of him. So when you look at it from a coaching standpoint, one guy only had to use a screwdriver for the job. And he got a lot of jobs done because he only needed a screwdriver. The other guy had to use his entire toolbox from day one. So he's got more practice at using his entire toolbox as the guy that got everything done with the screwdriver. Does it mean the guy with the screwdriver was doing it wrong? No, he got every job completed that he could fix with that screwdriver. But when it comes to this guy who's using all of his tools, he's not going to be able to match up. And that's basically what happened. When you look at it, why was Crawford able to look so dominant in the fight, in, in your opinion? Like I said, Crawford has been forced to use his toolbox. Crawford also has been looking for an opponent 
that catapults him to the top of the pound for pound list for five years. He's always been there. Nobody knew it because he didn't have the opposition to get him there. You understand me? Floyd had De La Hoya first. Then he had Pacquiao. Then he had Ricky Head. So he had a lot of names that people knew. And that if you beat these guys, they would catapult you. Tyson Fury had Wilder. Three times. Put him right up there. You feel me? Canelo had Triple G. Put him right up there. You understand me? So who did Crawford have? Nobody that the world knew. And when I say the world, yes, the world, but mainly the United States of America. Because even the guys in the UK know that if you can't conquer in America, you're not bona fide. They've talking about a, a rematch uh, taking place at 154 pounds. In your opinion, as fighter and, and coach, should they do that? How does that look? As a coach, I want to let Earl go get everything checked out and make sure he's neurologically okay. If his mind, everything's okay and his body's okay, then we'll consider a fight at 154. But we need some time to make some adjustments because we haven't been forced to make adjustments in our career. So to make adjustments means that we got to go take some time and work on doing different things. And truthfully speaking, we should sign a rematch clause, but tell them let us have one or two fights between to get ourselves right for that rematch. You understand me? So if we can work, get us a couple fights in, that we can work on our other tools in our box that we haven't used or had to use, this gives, this gives us a chance to come back and fight a much better fight. Secondly, we don't have to pull ourselves down so far and wait at 154. So maybe we won't be as sluggish with the weight. You understand me? Because we know Earl been killing himself for years now to make 47. Last but not least, um, like I said, to me, the, the, the way we go into the fight it has to be different. You know, you have to come in the fight with, with, a, with a mindset of we are pound for pound one of the best but we're also fighting pound for pound one of the best. When you know that, that changes the whole landscape. Does it look any different, in your opinion, at 54, given Crawford's skills? The weight, the weight is not what's going to make it look different. That's why I told you all those three things. All of those things have to take place. If he just goes in and fights Bud again the way he is now, he can fight him at 54, he can fight him at 65, none of that would matter. Um, I'm a guy that says this with great confidence because I know I fought from opponents at 153 to opponents to 226. Before I lost the weight going back down, it didn't matter who you put in front of me, they weren't winning. Um, so with Bud not ever having that drastic weight loss, never having gone through no drastic car accident like, or nothing like that, anybody you put in front of him, he gonna take him apart. You know, he wants to go ahead and challenge for undisputed at 154. Jermel's uh, the, the champion there, but he's moving up to go ahead and, and fight Canelo. You know, for you, what makes sense for Bud at, at this point? Does he do the rematch and then go for other fights, or, or do you think this is kind of like the cherry on top, and, and after this he should more or less uh, retire on top? Bud has two two options. A, he can continue going up and wait, see how far he can go. I think he said already 54 is his max. Yeah. So he could campaign that going to 54, maybe doing a rematch, or like I said, let Earl get himself back together first, when it makes more sense, then do a rematch. You understand me? So for me, to let Earl get himself together first, then do a re rematch is much better. Um, to fight to fight him right now, it's not good because, like I said, just the weight, the weight gain was not the only problem. So. Where do you rank... Terrence, in your opinion, uh, Roy, and you've seen so much in your career amongst you know the the other all-time greats. Like, wh wh where does Terrence sit from what you've seen with your eyes, uh, with his skills? Well, you know, you got to put him in the top 15, maybe the top 10, because he definitely had the skill of a top five. Just that he hasn't had the opposition that some guys were able to get, and that's not his fault. You understand me? So, uh, I said the same thing when I fought. Then it got the nerve to say, ain't "Fight nobody." I just make him look like nobody. He just made one of the best fighters in his weight class look like nobody. That's pretty damn good. You understand me? So you got to rank him probably in your top ten, maybe even your top five. Cause, because to be honest with you, with you, how many guys have we seen that can outbox one of the best fighters in the world orthodox style, then can come back and outbox one of the best fighters in the world as a southpaw? Not many people do that. Not many people have the confidence to try that. He'll fight a southpaw as a southpaw, and he'll fight an orthodox as an orthodox. There's not been nobody except Marvin Hagler that we saw do that before. Now, we saw Marvin do it, but to, to me, Marvin still wasn't as fluent 
and he wasn't as powerful on both sides or explosive on both sides as Earl is. I mean, not Earl, as our Bud is. Yeah, he was good. He was calm. he was smooth. I can't say he wasn't smooth. I think the word with Marvin was Marvin really never was an explosive type fighter. He was always kind of a monotone. He would stay the same, but he gonna stay the same the whole night. But he just kind of stayed the same. Crawford can turn southpaw and explode. He can turn right handed and explode. That's the difference. Does this end the, uh, not end the argument, but there's been discussion that maybe, you know, Crawford and Inoue are going back and forth tussling for like pound for pound that maybe Inoue because of the multiple weight divisions. You're shaking your head no. Tell me why no. Because Inoue also, when he first moved up, he lost to Donaire. Mm. Don't forget that. Bud ain't lost nobody. Mm. Moving up or down, he moved up three times. Mm. He lost nobody. Mm. Don't tell me he better than Bud. No. Mm. I got, you got to give credit what credit's due. When Tyson Fury beat Wilder the two times, we had to give him the pound for power because Bud hadn't had that opponent yet, right? When Canelo was on top, beat Triple G, was doing what he was doing, we had to give him pound for power because Bud didn't have that opponent yet. That don't mean that they were better than Bud, but Bud didn't get the opposition to show us. So we had to give it to him. Now he got the opposition to show us. No, you can't put anywhere and nobody else above that because now he proved what we already thought. We just didn't see him against the best opposition near his weight class. See, this is the thing people don't understand. This is what I like about Bud. He's a, he reminds me of Roy. We ain't got to have the best opposition in our weight class. We want the best opposition near our weight class. Mm -hmm. You understand me? Yeah. And and to me, I think Earl would have did the same. Because I think Earl is also that person. It's just that he didn't get a chance to do it because he stayed what way so long. But I think he's also that person. I read a thing that uh, Chris made a decision to go to another trainer. Uh, what happened there? Nothing happened. It's just that the way when the fight kept getting put off and on and off and on, I got so many other fighters that I got to work with. Not known fighters, but they're still my fighters. But my fighters are like my kids. So if my kid has something that comes up, and before the other kid do, then I got to go to my kid. Yeah, this kid may have a bigger event and maybe more money, but that don't matter to me. All my kids, all my fighters are my fighters regardless. You understand me? So if they got a less of a show, but they got a show, they got to have their coach there. So when he called me back, I said, look, man, I got a few guys fighting right now. I can't come to Vegas. So it might be better for you to try to find some buzz right now because I just can't go to Vegas. Right now. Like, I'm right here at this fight right now. Yeah. I couldn't do it. You know, then I had Archie. Archie was going to fight the day before his fight got rescheduled. Mm -hmm. So after this fight, I was due to lead to go with Archie. So I knew I wasn't going to be half 10 because I already had made the decision. Well, quite naturally now, Archie fight got canceled, got pushed back. So now I could have went after this fight to him, but you no, know, I didn't want him waiting in, 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 in limbo. Because he got a fight coming up, he got to go. So I told him it's best just to find somebody else for this fight. And he went with uh, Bo Mack, who I think is a great fit for him. Uh, Bo Mack's a very good trainer. Um, Bud team is on top right now. Why not go with the top team if you're going to go? You know, so. When you look at this rematch coming up with him and, and Liam, what's different or what has to be different for him, having coached him in the first one? Just have to listen to what the coaches tell him. You know, the first fight... <sighs> He did what he, what he wanted to do. He didn't do what we trained to do. You know, so first fight, we trained to push Liam that way. He went out and boxed him. I said, you could do that a round or two, but you can't fight him all night like that. You got to get him going that way. As good as Canelo is, Canelo had to immediately get him going that way. If we don't get him going that way, it's not going to work. He didn't do that. He let him come this way too long. And when we let a man be in his comfort zone too long, especially a man with the caliber of Liam Smith, anything can happen. You know, the, the other interesting thing on that is, uh, you know, not his first loss, but his first knockout loss. You know, how, how can one bounce back from that and, and not doubt themselves? Well, he went a long time before he got knocked out, you know. Um, to me, there was an elbow that got caught him first, which I think attributed to the knockout. So I ain't going to blame on just the elbow, and I'm going to blame on just the knockout because he did sustain the elbow first, then he got took out after that. So. I don't know, that could have had something to do with it. May not, I don't know. To me, I think it may have, but it is boxing, so those things happen. Um, so for me, he just has to come back, put in his mind that he wants to win and go get it. Fighters are not made when they win. Fighters are made when they lose. That's when you find out what you really got. Roy, good uh, chatting with you as always. I appreciate it. Uh, maybe we'll see you in the corner of, of Fury. Tyson with, with Ngannou, maybe you're in there to kind of spur up some, you know. If he needs it, you know, Tyson, I already know. If you need a trainer, I'm here. <laughs> All right, Roy Jones Jr., Marcos Villegas, Fight Up TV, thank you for watching us.